Thank you, Senators. That concludes the discovery of formal business. I have received the following letter from Senator Lyons. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The need for Morrison Joyce government to stop blaming First Nation Australians and instead take responsibility for its bungled vaccine rollout, the dangerous situation in Western New South Wales and its failure to prepare and protect First Nations communities across Australia from the spread of COVID, including a failure to properly communicate and ensure access to health facilities, food security, adequate housing and isolation place places. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Can you, you, Senator, Senator Urquhart moves the motion, and I call Senator McCarthy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. In early March 2020, the Australian government convened the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Group on COVID-19 to develop and deliver a national management plan to protect communities and save lives. The four-phase plan developed included, firstly, preparedness, secondly, de developing advice on a range of actions to prevent sustained community transition. Transmission. Thirdly, developing an effective response to outbreaks in communities, including the potential deployment of mobile respiratory clinics. And fourthly, stand down and evaluation. Lessons learned from this plan were to be incorporated into future national pandemic planning. In the event of positive coronavirus cases in remote communities, provision was made to evacuate early cases to enable an effective response and limit exposure to other community members. Work was done towards opening GP-led respiratory clinics to provide advice and health care to people with mild to moderate COVID-19 symptoms, while reducing the pressure on hospitals and the risk of transmission by visits to regular GP clinics. The advisory group, which became known as the task force, agreed the preparation of culturally appropriate and consistent advice to First Nations health services and communities was a priority. Obviously, at the start of the pandemic, vaccines were pretty much over the horizon, so planning for the rollout wasn't included in the initial planning phase. But the point here is that there was a plan. There was clear communication about the threat of COVID to First Nations people, communities locked down, and took their own initiatives to restrict visitors. The community-based and controlled First Nations media organisations rolled out some innovative and creative content to get the message out. The government backed them with a small amount of funding, but what they did with that money was remarkable. Some great ads promoting good hygiene were produced, jingles and songs were written and broadcast, with community leaders and identities leading the way. They used social media, radio, local leaders to get the facts out and to keep communities safe. Informing people about the importance of washing hands, keeping 1.5 metres apart, of keeping movement to a minimum, of developing new ways to observe cultural obligations like sorry business. The government backed First Nations communities and organisations to get the job done. Community controlled organisations worked together to inform people about the facts. And guess what? Up until a few days ago, we had not lost one elder. Earlier this year, we were celebrating that in contrast to indigenous populations in other parts of the world, Australian First Nations people had escaped the pandemic relatively unscathed. Just 147 cases up to the start of the year and no deaths. With all this planning done nearly 18 months ago, with what we knew worked to keep First Nations people and communities safe, all we can ask now is what the hell happened? And let me tell you, it's not First Nations organisations and people who have dropped the ball here, and it's not our community controlled health sector, it's not our First Nations media organisations, it's not our housing associations or land councils. They have continued strongly advocating for the need for adequate vaccine supplies for health workers to be ready on the ground, 
for facilities to be set up for people who needed to isolate, for assistance and backing, encountering the dangerous misinformation that's getting around. The Morrison Joyce government and its ministers keep falling back to the line of vaccine hesitancy. This is their attempt to abrogate all responsibility for the ongoing tragedy that's continuing in Western New South Wales. What they are saying every time they blame vaccine hesitancy for the spiralling caseload is that it's Blackfellas fault for not getting the needle, for believing the stories that are out there, for putting themselves at risk. Well, guess what? I didn't hear them saying that every time a person in Bondi got COVID or Byron Bay or the Whit Sundays. I didn't hear the Prime Minister, the Health Minister, or even the Minister for Indigenous Australians saying those wellness gurus in Byron just need to overcome their gullible beliefs, their susceptibility to being conned by COVID deniers and just get vaccinated. I don't hear the Prime Minister taking action against members of his own coalition who are out there peddling COVID misinformation directly leading to any kind of thoughts on vaccine hesitancy. The Morrison government's cowardice in refusing to take strong action against the lies, the dangerous lies being spread by their own people, in particular, the member for Dawson is reprehensible. They won't take action because they're too scared he will pack up his bag of conspiracy theories and leave the government facing a by-election. In the words of the Deputy Prime Minister in an interview last month, if you start prodding the bear, you're going to make the situation worse for us as a government, not better. And I'll say that to my colleagues. I can assure you that when you've got a thin margin, don't start giving reasons for a by-election. The Morrison-Joyce government is happy enough for one of their own to go around promoting vaccine hesitancy, but let one First Nations person say they're concerned about getting the needle because of the misinformation being spread, like from the member for Dawson, then it's all about First Nations people being foolish enough to believe what they say. It's their fault for putting lives and communities at risk. That's what this government is saying. Nothing to do with the failures of its own performance, Nothing to do with the Prime Minister's failure to deliver on his promise to vaccinate 1B priority groups by winter. And today, on the first day of spring, less than 21% of First Nations Australians have been fully vaccinated. The Morrison Joyce government have failed spectacularly to get messages out there countering the misinformation and directly targeting First Nations audiences. At the outset of the pandemic, Labor supported the government's move to fund community-controlled First Nations media organisations to produce and broadcast their messages about staying safe. The funding, and it was only about 230,000, supported local broadcasters to produce and broadcast health and safety materials to address local issues, concerns and misinformation. It also helped broadcasters engage the support of local elders and leaders to pass on the importance and the gravity of the COVID-19 pandemic. It worked. The media organisations developed those messages in their language, relevant to their audience, and it resonated with the community. They weren't messages devised in a boardroom in Canberra or Sydney and farmed out to broadcasters that no one understood or listened to. We knew what worked. We knew about the vital role First Nations community control organisations have to play. But the Morrison-Joyce government didn't learn and it hasn't listened and it did not prioritise the health and safety of the vulnerable. Your priorities have been made very clear now in this vaccine rollout. This government prioritises the implementation of the harmful and unproven cashless debit card over keeping First Nations communities safe from COVID. And the proof's there. This government's translated material about the cashless debit card into 13 Northern Territory First Nations languages. There are ads spruiking the card on First Nations radio. In print, there are ads and articles flogging the benefits of the cashless debit card. There are even items in local council newsletters urging people to sign up. Yet nationally, radio ads about COVID have been translated into just six First Nations languages and only two here in the Northern Territory. 
there is a woeful lack of community relevant information. And this is completely down to this government being totally unable to hear, to consult and to coordinate with local First Nations organisations. Vaccine hesitancy is nothing more than a failure of this government to firmly counter misinformation and to implement a comprehensive communication strategy with First Nations communities in First Nations languages. It's shameful that the Morrison Joyce government sees no issue with continuing to not listen, to not heed, to not plan and to not care for the most vulnerable Australians in this country, First Nations people, disability people, those that you said you would have vaccinated by the winter. Prime Minister, you had two jobs vaccination and quarantine, and you have failed. Thank you, Senator. Senator Bragg. Oh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and I rise to address the Senate on the question of this urgency motion. Uh, and these are very serious matters, and I will, will seek to spare you the talking points as we try and address uh, what is a, uh, a serious and a grave situation. And I agree with Senator McCarthy. It's not appropriate for people to blame uh, the, the people. Um, this is not about blaming any Australian. Um, I don't think it's a good look for politicians to blame people. Uh, and I don't think that is what is happening. Um, I mean, the issues here are, uh, are acute. They are uh, happening in the west of my state in towns that I've visited and spent uh, quite a bit of time in, towns like Brewarrina and Burke, uh, Walgett, Canamble. Um, and uh, they, are, they, are, they are towns that do not have uh, ritzy facilities. They have, um, in many cases, quite reasonable medical facilities that are run uh, by passionate people at the AMSs. Um, and so the whole point of this was to try and keep um, uh, the COVID infections out of these communities because for obvious um, direct health reasons, but also because the facilities in these places are, are not what you would find in Sydney. And that would be the same in any Australian state. And it doesn't matter who you are, the facilities are not as good in the bush um, in most cases. Um, and the sort of treatment that is required for people who um, contract COVID-19 uh, when it is a serious case um, um, would stretch a basic medical service very heavily. And so the objective right now in Western New South Wales, and I've spoken to some people that have, have been there in the past few days, um, is to try and uh, manage the people as best as can be achieved um, in those locations who have COVID. Uh, and when it is beyond the capacity of those medical institutions in those parts of the state, uh, they are taken by the Royal Flying Doctors Service to Sydney or to a larger hospital. The second part of the plan is to, of course, vaccinate people, vaccinate all the people who live there, uh, because that is the best protection. And what we are seeing um, across New South Wales is a real commitment to getting vaccinated. I think today we've hit 70 per cent of first doses in New South Wales, which is a real, a real feat. Um, I have spoken to people who are from Brewarrina. Um, I mean, their, their view is that we, in some ways we have been a victim of our own success and that there's been a sense of complacency uh, because uh, there were AstraZeneca vaccines available in these towns, towns like Dubbo, from the 25th of March this year. So it was available. 
um, and perhaps there wasn't a sense of, of urgency. Um, perhaps because the country had done very well, and I would argue, given how many remote Indigenous communities there are in Australia, the country has still done very well in keeping COVID-19 out of these communities. Um, but there is, there is COVID-19 in the west of New South Wales. Um, there is also COVID-19 in the town that I grew up in, in northern Victoria, uh, in Shepparton. Um, and so those are two communities which are dealing with COVID, but there are many, many, many more remote communities uh, that are not having to deal with COVID. Uh, and so that, that is one of the reasons uh, that has been put to me, that we have not had the level of vaccination take up that we would have liked. And as it stands uh, at about 35 per cent today, 35 per cent of people, Indigenous people have had a first dose. And that is, that is not high enough. And that is something that we need to, to turn around quickly, uh, particularly if there are likely to be further um, outbreaks which we want to prevent at all costs. Um, the other point to make here is that beyond the Royal Flying Doctors' Service uh, and, the, and the VAX hubs that have been set up in these towns, uh, there, there are the, the OSMAT teams. And these are Commonwealth Government teams uh, aided by the ADF and they're going around to people's houses, to their premises and offering them a, a vaccination. So if you um, are living in Walgett, which is a lovely little town, um, you, can, um, you can go along to the Mass Vax Hub, which I'm told is at the local footy oval, um, or you can be visited by an OSMAT team or an ADF team to receive vaccination in your in your front yard or in your in your house. So, I mean that that is really now the the, the, the focus. So, um, of course, with these communities in lockdown, it presents the same issues that people have to consider uh, in in urban issue in urban areas. Only that they are more pronounced because the technology um, is not as good. You know, I was talking um, this morning to uh, another person familiar with the situation who made the point that. The homeschooling there is very, very difficult. Uh, and the homeschooling is difficult because there is a low level of broadband penetration um, or good internet penetration. There is, of course, um, in many cases, a, a lack of uh, technology resources in the forms of computers and iPads uh, and the like, which are required to do homeschooling. And anyone who has, who has become familiar with this concept of homeschooling uh, would know that uh, it often does, in public schools, um, rely upon having some access to the internet and having some access to uh, an iPad um, or some sort of a tablet uh, in order to facilitate that. So the, the, the issues in, in that part of the state are, are, are acute from a health point of view, and there are these very significant other consequences that have arisen. Um, I, I would say that um, with the, the the vaccinations that are happening now in Dubbo, um, and they're looking at uh, basically 18 sites in inside the Dubbo LGA, and these are providing uh, about 7,000 doses a, a week. 7,000 doses a week is is a lot of doses um, in a town like Dubbo. I'm not sure exactly what the pop population is, but it would be somewhere around I think 40 or 50,000. Um, so. Um, very quickly, I'm expecting that we will see these vaccination rates go from 34% uh, as an average, um, if that is the same in Western New South Wales, I'm not exactly sure, um, um, up towards the, the overall population-wide average, which, as I say, in New South Wales is now hitting 70%. So these, these, are, these are serious issues. Um, I think that the only way we can manage this is through putting a lot of resources in, through the military, through the OSMAT, um, through the VAX hubs, and then the additional um, home support and care that is required um, in, these, in, these, in these areas. I mean, overall, the objective to keep COVID-19 out of Indigenous communities, I would argue, has largely been met. There has been a high degree of Indigenous input into the management of this pandemic. 
Um, um, we have had, sadly, one Indigenous death, but overall it has been a strong performance. We are dealing with this outbreak in Western New South Wales, uh, which is in a number of very small towns. And I emphasise again for the, for the Senate um, that the, the towns like Brewarrina and, and Burke, they are small towns. They are really small towns. Um, and they, 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 were, they, they were never going to have an opportunity or the capacity to deal with these things on their own. Um, now there has been an outbreak, we have moved resources into those places, and my hope is that we can get on top of these outbreaks pretty quickly, but you can't get on top of it without vaccinations, which is why the um, AstraZeneca and, sorry, and then the Pfizer um, shots um, are now available there. In a bigger town like Dubbo, which has more resources, it is, I'm sure, a bit easier, uh, but again, um, we, do need, um, we do need those shots to go into the arms. We're expecting uh, 6,850 doses a week in the Dubbo LGA, and that is really important that those, those go in because um, we don't want to lose any more people. Uh, losing one is more than, more than we should have. Thank you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. We are all, without exception, affected by COVID-19. We're all weathering the storm, but we are definitely not in the same boat. So there's the haves and the have nots. The ongoing impacts of colonization and land dispossession and the theft of our children by the governments of this country mean that our people are already experiencing the worst impacts of an inequality that we did not create. We are no strangers to dealing with infectious diseases to which we have no immunity. When the pandemic hit, we led the way in keeping our communities safe. But governments, both Labor and Liberal, sent us body bags before they sent PPE, assuming we would fail. Our people are always the ones to be hit the hardest because our health, legal assistance and income support services were already under strain before the pandemic because of neglect by Labor and Liberal governments. Don't make out that you care when, when you're in government, you do exactly the opposite of what the people want. Our people were very clear at the start of the pandemic and for decades before that, our people have been demanding homes for all, higher income support payments so that our babies would not go hungry, the immediate and safe release of imprisoned First Nations people, and more resourcing and public money for our health, social support, legal assistance and family violence prevention services. What did we get? We got what the old colonial system has always done to us, and that is dismissed us and ignored us and not allowed us to self-determine and decide our own destiny as first people of these lands. I want to pay my respects to my fellow First Nations senators who have spoken in support of this MPI, particularly uh, Senator Dodson and Senator McCarthy. It's too often that our people get talked about or we get spoken for, but we don't get to speak for ourselves. Times have changed, haven't they, when you've got to deal with black senators in 2021. Our people know how to look after ourselves and each other, and we certainly know how to do it better than any Labor or Liberal government. How long you fellas been here? 200 years. We've been doing this for thousands and thousands of generations. So when decisions are in our hands, our solutions work and we take care of our communities. That's why we need treaties or a treaty. We are better off when we are free to make the choices that are best for us. But today, Labor and Liberal governments around the country decide who does and who doesn't get to eat today. 
or who gets to be vaccinated or not, or who gets access to a good hospital or not based on the colour of your skin. Our people and our cultures are strong and resilient and just like everyone else, we thrive when we can set our own course. We need your solidarity. Our people are dying. Our, be our babies are hungry because too many Labor and Liberal governments over decades Senator have pushed Thorpe, up Senator Thorpe, your the time has budget. expired. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, I rise today to speak about the absolute catastrophe, catastrophe that is unfolding in First Nations communities in Western New South Wales because of the spread of COVID into those vulnerable communities. Completely avoidable, completely avoidable. And yet <clears throat> the Morrison government, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Mr Ken Wyatt, uh, Senator Colbeck in this place and indeed the Prime Minister are trying to convince us that all is well. Well, it is not well. It's not well. And today we have yet another letter from the Murray Ma Health Corporation pleading with Mr Morrison to send assistance to put in place specialist quarantine facilities to help with the overcrowding which was foreseeable what was going to happen. This is not the first time this community health organisation has written to the Prime Minister. They wrote to the Prime Minister 18 months ago. 18 months ago, to say we need an urgent plan. And for Senator Colbeck to stand in this place today and say, oh, it's all OK because we offered First Nations people vaccines as part of the 1B group, that's all they did. That's all they did. We've heard about communication failures. We've heard about vaccine hesitancy. We've heard about proselytising by religious groups. And all the while, the Morrison government is trying to pretend everything is hunky-dory. Well, it isn't. The Murray Ma Corporation know what's going on. They're on the ground in Western New South Wales. And we have put this government on notice. Earlier in the week, Senator Dodson and I wrote an urgent letter to Minister Wyatt to say, what are you doing about contingency planning in Western Australia? Many of our remote communities are on the border with South Australia and the Northern Territory. It's not rocket science to imagine that the disease can spread fairly quickly from Western New South Wales into Western Australia. Indeed, we had two truck drivers cross the Nullarbor uh, last week, last Friday, and they uh, turned out to be COVID positive. That's how quickly it spreads, and yet there's no plan there's nothing in place to protect remote communities anywhere in this country. And we've now got the shocking statistic of a man who's passed away in Western New South Wales. And the responsibility for that rests fairly at the feet of the Morrison government. They're in control of vaccine rollout. They're in control of quarantine. And they've failed at both of those jobs. They've failed at communication with First Nations communities. They sent white nurses into communities in Western Australia completely unannounced and wonder why we've got vaccine hesitancy. It takes communication. It takes elders. It takes cultural leaders to get communities vaccinated. It takes taking the vaccine out. And this uh, response earlier in the week that pharmacies are now able to give the vaccine where do they think the pharmacies are in remote Kimberley and Pilbara in Western Australia? What a joke. And it shows you how out of touch this government is and how they don't really care about what is going on. Because Western New South Wales is a catastrophe. They're the words being used by uh, the Murray Ma Health Organisation, the corporation. And it was absolutely avoidable. And the responsibility sits fairly and squarely with Mr Morrison. And there's time to fix things. There's time to protect other communities. But it needs you to sit down. It needs you to listen. It needs you to engage with Aboriginal community leaders. Because just making the vaccines available as part of the 1B group tick done is not good enough. It is not good enough. 
many of those communities, English is the third and fourth language that's spoken. And what are we doing with our communication? Nothing. In fact, when we met with General Fruin a couple of weeks ago, he admitted to us they hadn't got the communication right. 18 months in, we're making fundamental errors like that. We've got an uncaring government. The public will judge you. We are watching, and you'd better get to work right now, urgently, and fix the mess that you've created. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. Well, I am bitterly, bitterly disappointed by the actions of Labor today. Politicising a family's grief, politicising a community's angst, and prioritising blame over solutions, which is exactly what they've accused us of doing, but this is what they are doing. I want to put things in a bit of perspective on some of the issues raised today. This, this idea that uh, once Delta reached our shores, it's still entirely preventable to keep it out of our communities. As Senator Lyons herself just said, there was a case of a truck driver, an essential worker with all the right permits, who travelled to Western Australia and, yes, it was then discovered he had COVID. I want to commend all of the businesses, all of the roadhouses and all of the um, people across the nation, family businesses, who have got in place their COVID safe plans. Because the truth is the Delta variant is causing significant concern right across the world. No country has managed to contain a significant Delta outbreak. In fact, we saw in the UK, even though they had record high vaccination rates, when Delta hit their shores, it, um, they went back into various stages of restrictions and lockdowns to try and deal with it. It is undeniable that the infectious nature of the Delta variant is a significant factor in the situation we are seeing before us, not only in regional New South Wales, but also in regional Victoria and um, in Sydney and Melbourne. Now, I'm not for a moment trying to deny the problems faced by the people of World Kenya and other communities. But we have been working and will continue to work with our Indigenous communities to find solutions. In fact, in March last year, at the very, very early stages of the pandemic and before any lockdown, we set up the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Group. This is with Indigenous peoples, because, as is quite rightly said to us all the time, don't be the white people telling the Indigenous people what to do. Listen to the Indigenous people, and that's what our government has sought to do. In March, late March last year, that advisory group had developed a management plan. And indeed, the Murray Ma um, clinic that Senator Lyon was talking about, from May last year, they were a recognised uh, GP respiratory clinic doing great work with their people in Wilcania. And from March this year, they had transitioned to be a Commonwealth vaccination centre giving out the AstraZeneca vaccine. And from June this year, they've been able to give the Pfizer vaccine. And I thank them for what they're doing in their community for their people. But we are also doing other things because it is not a simple solution. Dealing with COVID is not a simple solution, and uh, we need to take a holistic approach. I'd like to also um, address some of the other outlandish suggestions by those opposite. Uh, Senator Lyons' comments. I want to draw to Senator Lyons' attention and to Labor's attention comments by the first assistant secretary of the Vaccine Cut Task Force during his presentation to the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19, 23rd of July this year. 
And I quote, in response to questions that I asked, because I have been asking through that committee ever since its establishment, are we rolling out vaccines in regional areas? Are we looking after our Indigenous people? I've been asking those questions, more so than those opposite. And the answer I got was every aspect of the COVID-19 response and vaccine rollout has been done in partnership with the Aboriginal health sector. But don't just take my word for it. Let's look at the figures. Working with them, thank you, Senator Polly. We did. We worked with them. We asked them. Oh, sorry, was it Senator McAllister? I apologise. <laughs> but let's look at the figures. In Australia, over 200,000 Indigenous Australians have now had their first dose. Over 108,000 are now fully vaccinated, which is over 20 per cent of the Indigenous population. Is that the same rate of the rest of the nation? No. But it is certainly a lot further than those opposite would have you believe. In relation to Western New South Wales, an additional 600 doses of Pfizer have been reallocated to the Dubbo Shire, um, and an additional 600 doses have been reallocated to the Dubbo Regional Aboriginal Health Service. More broadly, our government is working with 2,645 primary care sites in regional Australia, including over 1,500 general practitioners, nearly 1,000 community pharmacies. 27 Aboriginal controlled health care providers and, of course, our wonderful Royal Flying Doctors have set up 182 uh, Flying Doctor service sites. And while I'm talking about the Flying Doctors, because they are one of my favourite organisations, it may be pertinent to uh, repeat an anecdote that was provided by Minister David Gillespie during question time today. He told of the story of RFDS nurse Kellyanne Johnson, an Aboriginal woman with family from Jarvis Bay, who is now with the Flying Doctors providing vaccinations to residents in Wreck Bay, another Commonwealth Territory. Yesterday, Kellyanne vaccinated both the youngest and the oldest Aboriginal resident in that population, and everywhere in between, she says. Kellyanne has been a real inspiration to her community and following her community engagement is considered a local hero. As one Indigenous leader said, some of the kids now want to be RFDS nurses and I would strongly encourage them to follow that gallant career path. So I want to thank not only Kellyanne but all of our flying doctor nurses and the doctors and the pilots who facilitate getting them out there, and their logistics crew and ground crew. Thank you for the work you've been doing, because they have not just been vaccinating. They have also been providing medical evacuations. They've been providing uh, personal protective equipment deliveries into our regional and remote communities. And they are the ones who are going into the Kimberley and the Pilbara that Senator Lyons thinks our government was giving to community pharmacies. We know our geography, we know regional Australia, and we know how to service them. Back to Western New South Wales. Following the current outbreak um, that leaked out of Sydney, there's currently 690 cases. And yes, it is very sad that and there has now been a death. An Aboriginal man in his early 50s who was positive to COVID has passed away. And uh, my condolences go to his family. And I apologise that this place has chosen to take advantage of your grief for cheap political shots. In Western New South Wales, we have a multi-agency, multi-government approach to vaccinating our regional and remote population. Uh, we're currently working with the, com with the state government and the Aboriginal Health Services. We've got over 100 Australian Defence Force personnel deployed. We're using the Royal Flying Doctor Services. We're using the on-the-ground GPs and pharmacists who people trust and know and feel confident to go. And I'm receiving feedback from those 
in these areas about how relieved they are to see these people and to hear the messages. And yes, it is true. Communications, we haven't been rolling out communications, but have, they, have we always got the message right? Not necessarily. But that is where, and I thank the elders that have stepped up to encourage their communities. I thank Riverbank Frank, and I thank the other Aboriginal elders who are strongly advocating amongst their populations for people to roll up their sleeve. And I implore Labor to come back to the Senator bipartisan Davey, position we have. Senator your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to make a contribution to the debate on this MPI about the need for the Morrison-Joyce government to stop blaming First Nations Australia and instead take responsibility for its bungled vaccine rollout. Um, uh, the dangerous situation in Western New South Wales and its failure to prepare and protect uh, First Nations communities across Australia from the spread of COVID, including its failure to communicate, to properly communicate, to ensure access to health facilities, food security, and adequate housing and isolation places. I read that out specifically because this is also about years and years and years of neglect of First Nations communities, to the point where the government knew that First Nations communities were extremely uh, well, highly at risk from COVID. They knew that at the beginning of the pandemic. They knew it when they set the plan for vaccination rollout, which is why First Nations peoples were in 1A and 1B, and importantly, to make sure First Nations peoples got vaccinated early on. And yet here we are, exactly what was feared and what Myanmar warned the government about. But the government knew because they've known for years and years and years about inadequate community, not just in Western New South Wales, in my home state of Western Australia and in the Northern Territory and in South Australia. And I'm sure it's the same situation in Victoria and Tasmania. They knew this. They knew that our First Nations communities have a significant gap in life expectancy and a much higher burden of chronic disease than any other community in this country. And yet, the stroll out didn't even bother to really prioritise First Nations communities, same as they didn't on if uh, people in residential aged care and aged care workers for, and for disabled people. In New South Wales, the data shows a huge gap between First Nations and non-First uh, Nations vaccination rates in every region in the state. Why has it taken so long for the government to release this data but also to get these vaccinations in people's arms, to deal with the conditions that would lead to the situation that we find ourselves in now? This situation is unacceptable. And don't blame Delta. Don't blame Delta for this. We knew it with the Alpha that they were going to significantly, if it got into communities, significantly impact on those communities. And don't say that we're taking advantage of this to push this point, because that this is life and death for people. So of course we are going to raise it. Of course we are going to raise the point in this chamber that vaccinations are not getting in the arms of First Nations peoples and they have been let down massively. Senator Dodson. Senator Dodson. I can see that you're there, Senator Dodson. It, you might have to just check whether you're on mute. And if not, please, you'll have to log out and log back on. We'll go to is Senator McMahon there. Uh, yes, yes, I am here. Uh, pl please go ahead, Senator McMahon. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, well, look, the first thing that I would like to do on speaking on this uh, matter of urgency is to say that I absolutely reject the premise of this. Uh, it calls on, it talks about the need for the Morrison Joyce government to stop blaming First Nations Australians 
and instead take responsibility for a bungled vaccine rollout. Now, I reject all of that comment, all of that sentence. Um, who, who is said that anyone is blaming um, First Nations Australians, or in fact anyone else for that matter? And why do those opposite, why do they constantly have to find blame? You know, we, we talk about we're all in this together and we're all working together and we should have a bipartisan approach. Yet those opposite continually politicise this issue and continually want to uh, apportion blame to someone. Um, I, I haven't heard anyone in this government um, blaming First Nations Australians. Uh, yet, uh, you know, we're accused of doing that here. And uh, I absolutely reject that. We're not blaming anyone, yet that's what those on the other side continually, continually seek to do. Why does, why does there have to be someone to blame? Can we not just, can they not just join with this government in getting on with the job? Uh, and secondly, take responsibility for its bungled vaccine rollout. Um, there has been nothing bungled about this vaccine rollout at all. Yes, there have been aspects of it um, that may have been less than desirable, where things haven't worked out as planned, but it hasn't been bungled. You know, things, things happen. And uh, there's, this is unprecedented. This is an absolutely unprecedented situation. We're being asked to do something that we as a nation and we as the world have never ever attempted to do previously. So, you know, of course, not everything is going to go absolutely according to plan all of the time. But that does not mean that the job is bungled. Uh, and this government has been exceptionally good at dealing with it and in dealing with everything that has been thrown our way. And many things have changed. This is a dynamic. Uh, and it's a dynamic situation. And, and, uh, and we've dealt with everything that's come our way and we've dealt with it practically and efficiently. Now, what has become clear as part of this is that um, some of the, the, uh, the governments that are actually responsible for, as those on the opposite side say, getting jabs into arms, which is the states and the territories, uh, they have decided that they want to be responsible for, for health and for the vaccine rollout, and, uh, and that's fine. So they probably should be. Uh, they know their communities, and particularly with regards to Indigenous communities, they know those communities certainly better than the federal government does. So it's appropriate that they should be in charge. Yet we hear that, for example, in the Northern Territory, uh, there's, there's some fairly poor results coming out with regard to Indigenous communities. Utopia, one community in Central Australia, from the uh, the, the manager of the clinic there, had to possibly ten out of seven hundred rooms vaccinated, um, and uh, and Kintore, another remote Indigenous community in Central Australia, uh, approximately a report of one in one in four hundred one in four hundred people consenting to be vaccinated when a, a team went out there uh, with enough vaccine to vaccinate that whole community of over 400 people. Now, this failure absolutely has to fall at the feet of the Northern Territory Government. Again, not laying any blame, but if they are incapable, incapable, if they're incapable of doing this rollout, then they need to ask for help. We're certainly here and prepared to, to help and to provide resources and funds where they're needed. But the Northern Territory Government is very much in charge of this rollout in Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory. They need to admit that they are not capable of doing this effectively and they need to ask for help where they are, are failing in uh, their task of rolling out the vaccine to remote Indigenous Territorians. Come forward, say you're not doing the job, and your time has expired. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Technology is a wonderful thing from Broome. Uh, this MPI wouldn't be on our agenda, only that the 
in the other place yesterday afternoon, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, uh, Australians, was blaming hesitancy amongst First Nations people for the dreadfully low rates of vaccinations against COVID. Hesitancy is an issue that has to be overcome. And we still have a lot of work to do, is what the Minister said. But why is it that in September 2021, this government thinks that having a lot to do is news in this particular space? There's only one answer to that. It's because this government has been scandalously and callously negligent. At the very start of its rollout program, the government identified First Nations peoples as number one priority, the group to be focused in upon and prepared for the virus when it arrived. To the extent that hesitancy amongst First Nations people is an issue, it's not their fault. The government's bungled and inadequate messaging is the cause of that. And then there's the impact of wrong-headed evangelists and tin-pot religious elements that are said to be spreading propaganda to create fear amongst uh, about the vaccine and amongst the remote and susceptible communities. These are no more than wolves in sheep clothing, is the way I see them. And what's the government doing about this to fix this hesitancy and misinformation? Well, the minister yesterday gave us no comfort. If the government's got a plan to avert the uh, whatever the uh, hesitancy there is, then the minister told us nothing about it. This government is more concerned, it seems to me, about punishing people than managing the lives of First Nations people and getting them the vaccine that's necessary to avoid COVID. We know COVID is raging First Nations communities in Western New South Wales. And my awful fear is that it's only a matter of time before communities elsewhere are overwhelmed. And I've heard, we've heard why the connection between East and West happens. What we're witnessing in, West, in New South Wales is tragic enough. But if this scourge ever gets into remote Australia, the impact will be catastrophic. My own state of Western Australia has a hard border, but apart from occasional spot checks elsewhere, the policing of that border is readily confined to, or really confined to the main access points, like the highway and the airports. The border means very little to those in Aboriginal communities who regularly travel for family or cultural businesses, from the APY lands of South Australia and the Northern Territory into Western Australia and vice versa. I know that the Vaccine Commissioner of Western Australia has sought assistance from the Morrison government for the Defence Force to help out in these remote breaches. But as far as I know, there's been no AFD assistance provided from the Commonwealth government. These are times that really call for leadership and vision. Leadership from the top of the Commonwealth Government is needed, informed by a clear side of, of vision. We've heard Senator Seawood talk about the awful conditions that are well known in this country that prevail in the social indicator areas that are affecting First Nations peoples. So this calls for urgency, communication, organisation and action. We wouldn't be in this mess if the government had done its job and fulfilled its obligations to protect First Nations peoples. Lives are at stake and the government shouldn't hide behind Nacho and the peak organisations. Time's up. Government, get out there and do your job. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
I couldn't agree more that this is a matter of extreme urgency, which calls on the Morrison Joyce government to take responsibility for the dangerous situation in Western New South Wales. Why was this government sitting on its hands and sitting on data that clearly showed vaccination rates in First Nations communities in Western New South Wales was desperately low? Why did you not do something sooner? Because you just don't care. There's such a severe lack of adequate housing in Wilcannia that people are having to isolate themselves in tents because their homes are overcrowded. Locals have said that food being delivered is sometimes out of date and nutritionally poor. These fa failures and the utter disregard for First Nations communities is not new. They have been targeted systematically since the start of colonization and the pandemic has changed nothing. According to the government's own vaccination plan, First Nations people were in either phase 1A or 1B. They should have been vaccinated by now. They have, the government has no one to blame but themselves. Scott Morrison's government was told clearly that were the virus to enter a First Nations community, there would be devastating results given the abysmal rollout of vaccination, food insecurity, and the lack of adequate housing and appropriate health services. A loud and clear alarm was sounded at the very beginning of this pandemic. The Maori Ma Aboriginal Health Corporation wrote to Minister Wyatt 18 months ago. The letter outlined grave fears for Wilcannia if COVID was spread to the at-risk population there. It said, warnings from around the world are clear. The earlier we prepare and act, the better the outcomes will be. We cannot wait until the first case turns up in the community. And here we are now, not just the first case, but a large percentage of people and children infected and sadly, a First Nations man has died of COVID-19. The crisis unfolding in Wilcannia is not mere incompetence. It is a complete disgrace. The equally incompetent New South Wales Health Minister Brad Hazard has bounced the responsibility off to the federal government. Minister, Mr. Hazard had the audacity to say that he had many friends who are Aboriginal in Northwest and Western New South Wales, and that he was quite frustrated Everyone knows Mr. Hazard can be very vocal about his frustrations when it suits him. So why was he so quiet about this one? Why didn't he turn his frustration into action? The federal and New South Wales governments have completely failed First Nations communities in Western New South Wales. Wake up, First Nations people know what is best for their communities. Listen to them and do what they are asking you to do. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, in my state of New South Wales, we are now seeing the tragic consequences of Mr. Morrison's lack of urgency. His lack of urgency on vaccines, on quarantine, and on protecting First Nations communities. We have seen his death, the first death of an Indigenous person in the pandemic, a man in his 50s in Dubbo. Nowhere in New South Wales has a higher rate of infection than Wilcannia, where more than 10% of the mostly Indigenous local community have contracted the virus. Mr Morrison has warned about the potential for a COVID crisis in Wilcannia 18 months ago, he was warned. 18 months ago, in March 2020, the Murramay Aboriginal Health Corporation wrote to the Morrison government. To quote directly from that letter, they said, we cannot wait until the first case turns up in the community, or worse, the first hospital case presents. The poverty and extreme vulnerability of Aboriginal people and communities in Murdipaki region is a direct result of decades of failed government policies. I went on to say, I'm sure you can understand our anxiety that these failures not continue or worsen through the COVID-19 crisis. That was in March of last year. As of yesterday, there were 73 cases in Wilcannia, which has a population of just 745 people. The worst fears expressed by the Murramay 18 months ago have tragically been realised. As Murramay said in a separate letter sent to the Prime Minister just last week, make, I quote, disappointingly, pointingly, no tangible plan was in place prior to this outbreak that could have been easily implemented. As a result, we've been playing catch up from day one. Our systems and services are ill-prepared, actions are too slow to be implemented, 
Our response has been substandard. Existing resources and expertise is not sufficient. It is clear based on these comments that there has been an utter failure of preparing and planning by the Morrison government. Dr Peter Maloof from the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council of New South Wales said yesterday, and I quote, our community controlled health services in those areas certainly expressed to government 18 months ago about preparedness and investing in resources in those communities. But those requests have obviously been silenced by both the Commonwealth and New South Wales governments, and now we're seeing these high numbers of cases. He went on to say, it's just horrible. It's worth remembering, while Mr Morrison is doing the rounds and the media talking about a national plan, that under Mr Morrison's earlier plan, his vaccination plan, the First Nations people were part of phase 1B of the rollout and were supposed to be fully vaccinated by this winter. Well, winter has come and gone. Spring is here and just 12.5 per cent of Indigenous people in New South Wales are fully vaccinated. So not only has Mr Morrison not heeded the warnings of the Murrah May and other groups, not only was there no plan in place in the event of an outbreak in far western New South Wales, but he's also failed to hold up his own vaccination plan. But I want to contrast that to the inspirational leadership we are seeing from members of the local, those in the local community. Last night, NITV shone a spotlight on Leroy Johnson and Walpa Thompson, who are making five hour round trips to hunt and deliver kangaroo meat from the uh, Mutawinji National Park, which, which Mr Johnson manages and then taking it to Wilcannia to stop the, to, uh, to the local community to be stopped from going hungry. Well, they're called this operation Deliveroo. If only the gig platform Deliveroo had even a sliver of integrity and community spirit that you have shown. But I, have, I want to commend Mr Johnson, Mr Thompson, and those who are supporting their efforts, including the CEO of Baringi Native Title, Derek Hardman, Baranyinji Elder Robert Kennedy and local broadcaster Brendan Adams for stepping up and demonstrating some sorely needed leadership during this outbreak. I hope the Prime Minister is taking note and quite clearly the government does not know how to represent and support regional Australia and quite clearly the concerns raised by this community are rallying call for the government to get Senator its act Sheldon, together. Sheldon, your time has expired. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Those have it. Division required. Ring the bills.
Jenny, Jenny, can I grab you for the... Stop the bells. The question is the urgency motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart Teller for the ayes and Senator Davey Teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 13. The question is resolved in the negative. Senator Seawitt.